All right, let me let me start uh, uh, with what we were talking about off camera. Yeah, about snooze. Stop buying Zin pouches. Start <laughs> doing what I used to do and import it from Sweden. Well, the the reason the reason I should say that we're we're talking about That's this at all, Once again, buysnooze.com. Is because I keep getting promoter tweets, and I blame this entirely on Liam for something called Nordic Spirit, which is a tobacco-free snooze. That's um, stupid. Which is literally, I, I just imagine this as a little f- packet of like herbs, herbs if you prefer, <laughs> that you just like put in your lip and just leave there. There is herbal dip. Uh, oh, that, that's... just eat, chew grass if that's yeah, what you want just, to do. It's it's Smoky Mountain. Yeah. It's not very good. It's designed it's to fucking like it's 18th help you century stop, French but... peasant famine. A uh, fucking uh, it smoking sucks. method. And it doesn't taste like dip. It tastes it, not good. I've had it. Ross has seen me use it. It's not good. I I'm oh. imagining I'm imagining a sort of like a uh, dip that's rebranded as a health food or a health yeah. substance. It's like. Infused with the essential oils and crap. Yeah, it you soothes know. your T zone. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could just buy Grizzly Wintergreen like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Chew Grizz, people. Or as I did like the tweet you did, because this yeah. is just talking about each other's tweets now. Yeah, a tweet uh, review. Uh, no, tweet dear. review. Where yeah. it's the cat and you have uh, uh, Copenhagen Wintergreen long cut. No, not that one. Yes, up a level. Yes, thank you, because that is oh, right, that was yeah. my life for a long <laughs> when time. When you've got to fucking like manipulate a cashier like one of those remote control yeah. arm games. Oh, it sucks. Yeah. People yeah. are such an asshole, they feel stupid, but they don't do yeah. the displays themselves, the distributor does. No, it, it, well, it got worse in Britain because like and thankfully this happened to me after I quit smoking, but they did the plain packaging law. So now you have to like be able to go, okay, yeah, I'd like a pack of like lucky strikes or whatever. Um, pick them out of this identical lineup. Uh, up a bit, up a bit, left, left a bit, left a bit. It's like yeah, great. I mean, it's a good public health intervention to make smoking as annoying as possible, but like... Do they have else? chewing tobacco in the United Kingdom? And not commonly. It's not really okay. It's not really a thing here. Like, the, the more, sort of like, generally speaking, you'd either do cigarettes or you'd have like a, a pouch of like loose tobacco that you'd either roll your own or like smoke a pipe with oh. if you're really old. Um, but like, yeah, no, it's it's not really a thing here. And you can't buy snooze. Oh, according to whoever this tobacco company is in the United Kingdom, you actually can't buy dip or snooze. You can only buy snuff and chewing tobacco. This is, an, this is a like a repressive country, man. Every day it reminds me more of George Orwell's novel 1984, uh, in that you can't buy snooze or uh, dip. Anyway, this yeah, has been this has been the snooze hour. Um, once again, I, I order from about, Sweden. About, about to say. Uh... Well, welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters. Mostly about slides. snooze, really. No, it's about I, snooze. So, sometimes we talk about various forms of tobacco. Yeah, you shouldn't um, smoke, kids. It's not, it's yeah, not good. You don't, should, don't do it. No, also, you shouldn't it, mail me tobacco. Uh, shouts to the one guy who did, but I got yelled at. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get Liam in trouble. So, um, anyway... Uh, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm I'm person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Okay, go. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I am the person who is talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Yay, Liam. Hi, I'm Liam Anderson. My pronouns are bi and snooze. <laughs> you're, re- you're really <laughs> going hard for the attempt to get bi snooze to like sponsor, <laughs> sponsor us. us. Damn it! We're yeah. wearing like we're all wearing like NASCAR fire suits with a shitload of sponsors on them to record. We, people like, keep uh, asking us to cut ads, and we keep refusing because none of them are buysnooze.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want us to advertise your product, have you considered getting a cooler product? <laughs> I'm not I'm not cutting your War Thunder ad. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> God, I used to play my fucking pronoun, War Thunder. My pronouns I, are he and him. I spent yeah. a year and a half playing War Thunder near on every yeah. day. I got just far enough that I got my first jet, got immediately owned, and never logged in ever again. War Thunder is Earth's greatest scam. Never ever play War Thunder. So we're not cutting an ad for them. No. S- speaking of jets getting owned. Oh shit, that's a nice ass segue. I was about to say, well, um the, uh, the Soviet Union never killed James Bond, but they did get a 007. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh. Which is um what we're going to be talking about today 
Korean Airlines Flight 007. I'm just sad that, like, th th clearly this got owned so hard that you can't even do that. It's not supposed to look like that. Instead, mm -hmm. you have a picture of what it is supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like, yes. Now it doesn't. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we have to do the goddamn news. We're so fucked, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, yeah. There we got a, a new COVID <laughs> variant came out. Uh huh. This, this new, one. New COVID just, just drops. <laughs> just, came, just came from Not the lab. South yeah. African. Not, Not South per African. No, probably Apparently, Dutch. Yeah. Possibly what a Dutch. surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carried entirely through shoe polish. Um, yeah. And the losing. And losing in the World Cup final. That's right. Despite me putting $150 on you dumbass people. <laughs> The Omicron variant, because uh, we're getting it kind of into the weeds of the Greek alphabet here. Yeah, and they skipped uh, Nu and Z because um, they didn't want to make it seem like it's new COVID, because because people would get paranoid, and they didn't want to call it G because that Xi Jinping, you know, and then everyone oh. would think, oh my god, it came from a lab in China. When you know that's so uh, fucking tenuous, isn't isn't <laughs> it, isn't it like the, isn't the Greek letter is chi, right? It just is the it X chi? is yeah, I think X so. I is Z, because yeah. alpha, uh, alpha Z Delta was the sorority. Anyway, really? oh, okay. Well, I don't right. I don't remember I my Greek. It Z. Listen, uh, college was a long time ago. <laughs> We're all old now. That's true. If a, co that if a college fraternity pronounces it that way, it's probably right. <laughs> uh, you, you have to hold the match. They're very intellectual there. Re recite the Greek alphabet before the match burns your fig. No, just me. Okay. Okay. That's a fucking like that Lawrence out. of Arabia shit. There. Like that out. Like that out. Also, the name of the fraternity. <laughs> so, so, so this thing is all kinds of fun because it's like got a million mutations all on the spike protein, which is you know what the vaccines target. Um, and it anecdotally. A lot of people seem to have mild cases, but the data that's out would seem to indicate, you know, the reverse would be the general condition, right? Um, you know, but I guess everyone's, everyone's, uh, everyone who is, has, you know, a smart blue check mark next to their name uh, is saying, well, we have to wait for the science to come out to make any decisions. No, we don't Even, scream in panic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, which I, I, it's not going to come out for a few weeks, at which point it will have already run rampant. It'll be too late to do anything. Oh, anyway, yeah. This, I, was, this was going before we even knew where it was or where it was from. First detected in South Africa. And yeah. sequence there. It's which, not South African. Yeah, which, which brought back a shitload of travel bans, which is fun. That's going to be gone. Um, I, I, basically, the only thing here is that, that we would tell you is don't smoke and also. If you no, can, do smoke, cannot emphasize yeah. that enough. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you if you can get a booster shot, then yeah. uh, th th booster yes. shots have gotten to this point. Of, like because we call them boosters, right? And because there's been this failure of communication, people think that they're like a nice thing to have mm -hmm. instead of like an essential. And they are yeah. an essential, and you should get like a third dose as soon as you're offered one. Yeah, I'm gonna try and do it tomorrow, actually. Um, which hopefully won't delay this podcast because I had a nasty reaction to the second dose. <laughs> oh, you sure did, baby. No, I mean, as, as far as as far as anecdotes as far as anecdotes go, like everybody I know who's had a booster already is like uh, it doesn't really do anything. Like yeah, in, in terms of like reactions. So who's to oh, say? I, I, got, lucky. Well, I got knocked on my ass for about six hours. Yeah, mm, and I, I guess was, I'm just was, built different. Yeah, I, I was out Weaker. for like a day and a half. <laughs> Fuck you, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting um I'm I'm scheduled to get the booster and a flu shot the same day, and I'm gonna try and get them in the same arm. Nice. Oh, that'll be fun. Just like yeah, I just don't need to use this one. I'm gonna give myself the stranger a bunch of times when I get home. It's fine. <laughs> stool mm -hmm. hardeners, stool softeners, my body won't know what to do. Yeah. But that'll it, be the mortician's problem. <laughs> <laughs> if if you get the vaccine and the flu shot at the same time in different arms, your body takes a screenshot. <laughs> yeah, I saw you. I saw you do that tweet already. Thank you. This is tweet yeah. review. It's Twitter review. All right. Um, in other news, uh, the Supreme Court's going to uh, overturn Roe versus Wade. Yep. So, yep. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're gonna do it. I have nothing uh, funny to say other than fuck the Democrats. Yeah. Uh, fuck the Republicans. 
Yeah. I don't want to hear anything in the comments. It's just like, yeah, well, if you voted for, I did. All right. I voted for Joe Biden in 2020. I fucking threw up in my trash can and voted for Hillary Rodham Clinton in 2016. Yeah. Absolutely. You didn't hold up your fucking end of the bargain. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Right? Stop fucking you using Roe as a cudgel for like fundraising. Because that's Wait. all it is to these fucking people. Well, it's yeah, fucking it's it's it. It. Pelosi. It's like, uh, no. Pelosi said you could. <laughs> Pelosi said you could be a pro-life Democrat. No, you Hil- fucking can. Hillary yeah. had a party. Hillary had a pro-life VP uh, w- 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 candidate with Tim Kaine. Like, I, I, am I the only person who remembers that shit? Am mm-hmm. I going yeah. completely fucking insane? And of course, now, like, with a a fucking like a six two or whatever, six three, six, three. Six, six three, three, with a six three majority, like it's going to be road. Then it's going to be fucking Lawrence, Texas, too, yep. probably. Yeah. Um, it just it's sort of this long game that's been going for a generation. And the really funny thing that's going to happen is yeah. that Stephen Breyer is going to is going to fucking not retire and then die the day after Trump gets reelected. Yep, that's that's what's happening. It's gonna happen uh, while we're recording a podcast, and Justin's yeah. gonna become uh, deranged again. I again, I don't yeah. know. Um, I guess we'll put up something in the description about the very limited stuff you can do because yeah. who gives a shit? This has already been bought and paid for. Mm-hmm. They're gonna overturn Roe. Uh, abortion. I don't think I have to say this to our listeners. Abort- abortion is medicine. Abortion is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, cry about something else. Uh, yep. If you're listening to this podcast, you're not familiar with our politics. Absolutely, suck my nads and die. Yep. Uh, um. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, you should be pissed off. You should be pissed off at Democrats who think you're stupid. You should be pissed off at Republicans who are fascists. Mm-hmm. Uh, stop fucking telling me to elect Democrats when y'all won't do shit. And stop fucking emailing me asking for money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is this is the you know, and there's an easy solution here. Which no one wants to consider, which is Joe Biden Pack doesn't. Pack the court. Pack the court. No, 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 no. That's you're you're not being aggressive enough. Joe Biden does an executive order saying Marbury versus Madison was wrongly de- uh, decided. Yeah, which it was. Right? Ju- judicial and, review oh, is God. not real. It's unconstitutional. Yeah, get rid get of the it. fuck out of here. Get, get out of here. I don't, I don't give a shit about the Supreme Court. You know, go go hear some dumb appeals. Or something, <laughs> right? You know, right, st- get rid of this fucking this so fucking. A, thing. No one pow- else has it. The power you gave yourself. <laughs> yeah, from whole cloth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's great. Uh, we live in hell. Yeah. Home. Anyway, uh, this is an anti-Supreme Court podcast. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, zero zero, but as opposed to five four. Um, yes. <laughs> this is no more Supreme Court justices. America has no. evolved beyond yeah. the need. For Supreme Court justices, also the Senate, um, also, also <laughs> that, yeah. Um, what, what we're saying is constitutional convention immediately. Mm-hmm. Just write a new uh, one. Uh, the old one kind of sucks too. Yeah, you're supposed to write a new constitution every like forty years or so if you're a healthy state. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, that was the goddamn news. All right, I'll talk about something happy, like an airliner that got shot down. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So well, I did get rid of a, a U.S. congressperson. This is true, um, though not a senator. It was a representative. Oh, uh, that's yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, could have gotten, gotten a senator. We'll we'll talk about that later. Um, so I think we should have some context before we start here, and we have to ask the question: How do airliners navigate? Right? Because you know most of the sky looks pretty similar, especially at night. Uh, land is way down below you, right? So you can't like. There's not a lot of landmarks there to look at. Yeah. How do you just, do it? Just, right? just in general, you don't want to be in the cockpit of an airliner and turn around and see your co-pilot operating a sextant. Yes. No. <laughs> Although I believe I'm navigating airliners, by the stars. <laughs> they literally I, did do that. Yeah, in some like World War II bombers that kept in service yes, as passenger yes. airlines into the fifties, they had star viewing domes. Yep. yep. To do that, I. I believe airliners are still equipped with sextants as like well, a you should be, backup, right? backup, just, backup just measure. In case, yeah, just in case. I mean, the Navy was reintroducing celestial navigation a few years ago in case computer systems got hacked. <laughs> yeah. You gotta know how to do it. That's fine. I'm fine with that. You know, okay, so this is, this is the pre-GPS era, right? We don't have global positioning system, right? And these planes have to navigate over, like, especially large bodies of water like the Pacific Ocean, say, 
and you have to have a relative idea of where you are, where you're going, so on and so forth, right? And, you know, a big way to do it so that you, the pilot, don't have to worry about it is through autopilot, right? Hmm. You know, and this is also sort of a conversation about how does the autopilot know where it is, right? Well, um, the thing inflates, and then it, 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 there's like a big guy in the seat, and he right, steers the yes, plane. Exactly. Um, but how does Otto know where he's going? Um, and Otto has several settings he can choose from, right? Uh, so if you have like, you know, one option on your autopilot is you set the plane on a constant heading, right? So the autopilot maintains the current direction and altitude, right? Sure. Um, that's how it was explained to be an archer. So that's how I assume it works. Mm-hmm. Yes. But then you have other options, like you have VOR slash LOC, right? And this is, uh, this is something that puts the plane on a predetermined, cor- cor- predetermined course based on the location of big ground-based, very high-frequency omnidirectional radar beacons like this guy here, right? Mm. Um, that's usually useful over land or in high traffic areas, I think. I'm not an airplane expert. I cannot stress this enough. Yeah, stop yelling at us. <laughs> I always worry when we do these airplane episodes because I genuinely have no idea what I'm talking about a lot of the time. Right, yeah, <laughs> and you should have someone else on or not do them. Nah, 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 nah. Mm-hmm. Shut up. <laughs> you know, so you, you have ILS, that's your instrument landing system that responds to a whole lot of ground-based equipment to guide you into a runway, uh, sort of without, you know, having to do a visual approach, right? Um, but then there's a fun one called INS. That's the inertial navigation system, right? If you're going over the ocean, there's no ground-based radar, right? Hmm. Um, and you don't have GPS yet. Buoys. So what you wind up with is a sort of course which is determined exclusively by internal sensors and instruments, accelerometers, stuff like that on the plane, and sort of dead reckoning, right? And then there's specified waypoints, waypoints along the way where the system resets itself so the, the error doesn't get too great because if you're navigating exclusively based on previous positions, uh, that error factor just increases exponentially. Yeah, it like right? magnifies itself, yeah. Yes. So, But this inertial navigation system is required where there's no ground-based radar, right? But it requires the plane to be in the right place and going the right speed in order for it to work properly, right? Since these errors are, you know, they keep compounding, right? right. Um, and we don't use it as much now because, uh, you know, we have GPS to assist. But, um, you know, this was, this was a big way to do it back in, you know, 70s, 80s, what we're talking about right now, right? Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about the flight here. This is KL-007. It's September 1st, 1983, right? Da, 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 da. And yes. this, is, this is a scheduled flight from JFK Airport in New York City to Gimpo International Airport in Seoul, South Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my, my favorite. No, I'm not going to make the Gimpo suit joke. <laughs> Gimpo is a funny name. Um, <laughs> it is, but also. We have to yeah. be respectful because we're never respectful and people yell at us. Mm. Uh, the aircraft is a Boeing 747-230B, right? Um, and I don't know what 230B means in this case. I, it's like a, it's a, it's a 747 Had some DLC 200. installed. I was yeah. about to say, yeah. You know, it's, 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 I think it's bigger than a 747-100, but smaller than the 300. That's what the 200 is, but the, the 230 means something, and the B means something, I don't know. Um, I have no I, I, idea. I can tell you exactly what it means. So the so the seven four seven two hundred was the second model, like a Mark II. The, right. the B is just that it's a passenger uh, thing. So I, uh, I don't know what I don't know what the thirty is, but um, yes, uh, I see. Well, one of the things here is today a big flight like this can be done nonstop on like a seven seventy seven or you know some other equally long range, very fuel efficient plane. Mm-hmm. But um, in right. the mid 1980s, you couldn't really do that uh, with a 747, right? So this flight stopped in Anchorage, Alaska for refueling and then proceeded from there to uh, Gimpo International Airport, right? Now this, this flight had 246 passengers and 23 crew aboard. 
Uh, the plane was about half full with uh, six crew were deadheading, right? Um, and another another uh, person who was aboard was a, a congressman and prominent anti-communist representative, Larry McDonald, Democrat from Georgia. Oh, uh, no. love, love a Dixiecrat. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, pro- proper Dixiecrat. Yeah. Uh, he was a president of the John Birch Society as well. Oh, what an asshole. Yeah, Jesus was a, Christ. But he, was like a, he was like really known for his anti-communism. He loved McCarthy. Uh, big fan of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Jesus. They were flying to a, um, he was flying to, I believe, a summit for the 30th anniversary of a uh, South Korean peace agreement of some kind with the United States. I don't, I, I don't remember. I didn't write that down. Mm-hmm. Um, several other representatives and Congress and, and senators were supposed to be there with them, but they bowed out at the last second, wound up on the flight following them. I'm going to expose was, my ignorance here, but when did South Korea stop being a military dictatorship? Because I feel like it wasn't like, mm. If it wasn't at this point, then it had to have been in pretty recent memory. Yes, I yes. believe so. When did South Korea become a democracy? 1987? 1987, okay. alright. So, you know, the, the normal thing, you know, you go out and you fly and meet some dictators and stuff like that, you know? You know, that's 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 an all-American thing right there. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, the, 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 uh, the other folks were on the following flight, the other big big conservative names. I forget who it was exactly. Um, but uh, Mussolini. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Pinochet. All people, all people that Joe yeah. Biden was friends with when he mm-hmm. was in Congress. Mm-hmm. Yes. What's his name that was from South Carolina for a trillion years? Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond. Oh, Strom you. Thurmond. So this plane departed from Anchorage slightly late at 4 a.m., right? Uh, from Anchorage, right? Yeah. Uh. And this plane was supposed to make use of a designated air corridor, right? Mm, In this right. case, something called Romeo 20, uh, which was not the shortest trans-Pacific route from Alaska, but the shortest permissible one, right? Uh, you had to deviate slightly from you know, the Great Circle, which is the shortest route from any point on Earth to another point on Earth, right? Mm. Why'd I have deviation- to do that? The deviation was very it's important. It's the Cold War, Alice. It's because of the Soviet Union. There you go, buddy. We know about the Soviet and, Union. We're, yes. we're, we're, we're fans with, you know, some criticism. Uh, yeah. So, listen, uh, listen. Is, we're, 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 I'm still embarrassed about the Adam Something episode, all right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I gotta make up for it somehow. I'm triangulating. We're not we're not that anti-Soviet, okay? <laughs> he no. says as we do an episode about how the Soviet Union fucks up. Um <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um we're in sort of the late Soviet Union, right? Uh yeah, the gerontocracy. Yeah, imagine a real- imagine a society where everybody in a position of power is in their 70s at their youngest. I mean, just imagine the Can kind you- <laughs> of like unhealthy political system that would produce something where all of the decisions are made by a bunch of people who are so senile. Imagine they- such a world. Can you imagine that? Yeah, and we're we're actually post Brezhnev at this point. General Secretary Yuri Andropov is in charge, right? And mm-hmm. he's sort of he's sort of Brezhnev too, Brezhnev harder, right? And he's also in generally poor health, right? Uh, I think he was only General Secretary for two years, and some other guy came after him, right? I, I don't Kasigan, no, I want to say, Kas- yeah, and then. After that, uh, Gorbachev, of course, destroyed the USSR with revisionism. And pizza. Uh, yes. And pizza. Yes. <laughs> there, at this point, there yeah, were but- a lot of Soviet jokes about how old their leaders are. Um, my, my favorite of which is a very pure one, which is using the form of words that uh, was used for death announcements. And it's, <laughs> uh, the, the joke is... Dear comrades, of course you're going to laugh, but another great tragedy has befallen the <laughs> Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the <laughs> Communist Party. <laughs> yeah, so they, they go through a couple of general secretaries really quickly just because they keep the people who get in charge keep getting sick and dying. Yeah, they keep unplugging them. Very old. <laughs> 
dialysis machine, like a maid vacuuming, like trips over the cord to the dialysis machine, and uh, a great tragedy has befallen the Soviet <laughs> Union and the All Union oh. Communist Party. Yeah. Uh, you also have like sort of a, a, a the Soviet Union, the Car- Communist Party is very paranoid at this point uh, about Ronald Reagan, right? Yeah, this is the this is the time of <laughs> Abel Archer, the time when Ronald Reagan almost uh, 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 ignited World War Three by accident. Yeah, just because he kind of wanted to, you know. Mm-hmm. That man never saw a war he didn't like. Yeah, yeah. and he was doing all kinds of provocative crap. You know, he starts you know the Star Wars program. That was sort of the, the the strategic defense initiative, I believe it was formally called. It was um, yes. an idea they would put up some military satellites in space that could intercept Russian nuclear missiles before they reached their target. Right? Iron Dome, but it wouldn't have worked. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, the Iron Dome works so good, but yeah, you could probably. I mean, if the satellites up there is probably not the most difficult thing to intercept the nuclear missile at the slowest part of his trajectory. I guess that's true. I, yeah. I, I Still, don't know what you, I know you, you, you don't want to be gambling with shit like that. Yeah. And it's very dangerous to your sort of like deterrence theory uh, to be like, oh yeah, we can just like not, we can just win a nuclear war. Yeah, exactly. If you're like, well, we could just do a nuclear war, no problem. Yeah, like, yeah, like that, that's, just, that's a kind of like strategic <laughs> thinking that hadn't been prevalent in the US since like the 50s. This is one of the one of those situations where yeah the propaganda is always like you know the the Soviet Union was like willing to sacrifice its population in a nuclear war, um, and the U.S. was uh, you know uh, the the cautious Equal, one. And it turns out that's, to do that, but, that's uh, kind of uh, kind kind of the reverse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Plus the the Soviet the Soviet thinking at this point, as as far as we can tell from stuff that has like made it out, is that. Any as far as in, in in all Soviet planning, any nuclear exchange would have been started by the U.S. Uh, and it would be done typically in their thinking as an absolute surprise to them. And yeah. so that was that was sort of part of the paranoia is that like Reagan just decides, okay, now is go time, uh, mm-hmm. and you, you you're then in a situation where you have two or three minutes to obliterate the United States for fun, uh, and then the the USSR ceases to exist. Yeah, exactly. And um, and Reagan's doing other stuff, right? He's deploying nuclear missiles in Europe, mm-hmm. right? Turkey. Yeah, and he's uh, they just did a big naval exercise called Fleet X eighty three, right? Um, and that yeah, they know how to name them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that essentially involved the Navy bringing a whole bunch of boats to the edge of the Soviet of Soviet territory in the Pacific, right? And they sort of you know poked at them, right? Um. You know, they, they they would send aircraft to do flyovers. They'd sort of skirt the edge of territorial waters, right? Um, they had several flyovers. None of those aircraft were intercepted, and it was a big embarrassment for the Soviet uh, Air Force, right? Not um, even the Air Force. It was the, the, the Air Defense Force. It was like a separate command structure, uh, which then has to, like, negotiate with the Air Force to, like, deploy fighters. Uh, so there's there's internal Soviet politics going on here too, um, but the way in which these sort of like air defense tests were done was uh, you send a bunch of uh, a bunch of jets directly at uh, you know whatever sort of heading for Moscow is, and then in a, like an attack formation, and then at the last possible second they pull off just to try and like freak out the Soviets, which is <laughs> kind of a dick move. Wild, yeah, <laughs> wild. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also, I should point out the one of the other things about this is that like there's a lot of sort of airborne surveillance activity. Uh, you know, electronic warfare, uh, collecting you know missions for you know various kinds of like testing and uh, you know sort of nuclear things, uh, and that's all done by uh, platforms that sort of like a large, um, essentially like very similar to commercial um, aircraft, like. It, sort of adapted versions of airliners. Yeah, um, most notably uh, the Boeing RC-135, which we'll mm. get to in a second. Is that a rivet joint, I want to say? Yeah. Stupid ass code names. Yeah, so, you know, your, your, your air defense people are very paranoid. In general, uh, Soviet government's very paranoid, right? Uh, and they uh, they were convinced Reagan is the guy, he's the guy who's going to do the preemptive nuclear strike. Um, this could happen. Led by his time. astrologers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he's going to launch a decapitation strike on Moscow, which leads to another fantastic piece of Soviet technology because they design a failsafe. Uh, very or dead soon. hand, yeah, mm-hmm. dead hand or perimetra, yeah. if you prefer, <laughs> which is. If the if the the entire Soviet command is obliterated by a decapitation strike, oh, the missiles just fire themselves. Yeah, nothing to worry about. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, but a big result of all this is that uh, Soviet airspace was very heavily policed. Not somewhere you want to stray into accidentally, right? Uh, so flight paths avoided the most direct routes across the Pacific, so they could avoid Soviet airspace, right? Mm. Um, another effect of this is, I believe. Uh, the Soviet Union had no access to like air traffic control. Um, I don't know exactly how that worked. That well, would have come they up. They built their. Uh, I don't know if you have this in the notes. I'm I'm looking at something else. Uh, but the one of the outcomes of this, I believe, is that GPS eventually becomes public, and the Soviets build their own. Yeah, Glonass. Yeah. Glonass. Yep. Here, here's the route. This is Romeo Twenty. That this flight was supposed to take. You see, it goes south and swings uh, back up the Seoul, right? And what it wound up on was a much more direct route, right? Uh-oh. But the problem, problem was, they never engaged their inertial navigation system, or at least this is what the official report says, right? So once they got out of Anchorage, they passed Bethel, Alaska, which is the last radar station, right? And then they kept going straight. Um. And this is good. It'll save a little bit of time getting the soul, mm-hmm. but it's bad because you go straight over the Kamchatka Peninsula, right? And Kamchatka being, of course, very, very remote is where there were a couple of big secret military installations. Not to mention all the whaling boats. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, also, if, if you look at that, that, um, that flight path, it looks very much like the kind of thing that if you were an American, you would do as a kind of a fuck you. To, yes. uh, to Soviet air defense is to be like, yeah, I can just fly over this thing, skirt the edge of your airspace, and come back out again before you can do anything. Exactly, right? Um, and, and so, you know, of the theories there, you know, either they forgot to set the INS, or the other theory is the INS didn't kick in because they were too far off course already for INS to kick in, right? Because it doesn't start unless you're within seven and a half miles of your intended course. I don't know how that works, um, but uh, apparently the, it was a, a very user-unfriendly piece of equipment, right? Mm. You just get the fucking clippy pop up. It looks like mm-hmm. you're trying to to navigate to South Korea. Well, no, that would have been would more like noticeable help? as a thing. No. <laughs> womp womp. But anyway, so these pilots, they're flying, and they, they're drifting more and more off course, right? And they seem largely unaware of this. It's nighttime, by the way, so this is... <laughs> Definitely, so no, um, I can see shit. Great. Yeah, yeah you're, no, fl- you you're, you're flying over the Bering Sea at night. There's fuck yeah. all to look at. Or yeah. like, yeah, you know, uh, monotonous. They're, they're really bored. You know, they're so in, they start they're jacking it. it. They start yeah. jacking it. I yeah. spy yeah. with my little eye something black. <laughs> <laughs> something beginning uh, with Mig. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh no, we've we, we've been intercepted. <laughs> so there were there were some signs the plane was off course, right? Um, because they they had to relay their position every once in a while, the plane behind them, so they could relay it to air traffic control, right? And they so that plane behind them was KAL fifteen, which we mentioned earlier, right? Um, and it was strange since they never seemed to be quite in range for their very high frequency radio, um, so they had to use normal high frequency radio. And no one could understand them because high frequency radio has lots of interference, right? Mm. Um, you know, so that's kind of weird. But you know, it's probably nothing. Whatever, you know, we'll fix it when we get the plane on the ground. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's it's like an expected sort of error. Like you know, some which it happens with the radio is fine. Whatever. Yeah, it's probably fine. Um, if there's a real emergency, I, I, we can figure it out. Um, so you know, I, I, what else are you gonna do? Um, uh, what you would do is maybe check your position because there's there's other instruments on the plane that can figure out roughly where you are but yeah uh, the sextant yeah exactly <laughs> um, break out the sextant cabinet so at 3 51 a.m I'm smash it in with like a giant sextant shaped hammer in, in case of emergency break glass and behind there there's a sextant a telescope and a fucking bicorn hat <laughs> so at 3 51 petropavlovsk time um 
they <laughs> Thanks, <Ross>. hit, <laughs> they hit the Kamchatka Peninsula, right? And things start to go to shit. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So this particular day, there was a missile te- test occurring at one of the air bases on uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula, right? Okay, okay that's just horrible luck. Yes, yeah, very, very bad luck. <laughs> and Soviet Air, uh, air Defense Command knew there was an American RC-135 snooping around the outside of their airspace, right? Um, and the RC-135 was... Saying, la, 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 not touching you, not touching you, can't get mad. Exactly, la, exactly. La, 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 not touching you, not, not touching, touching you, you, can't get well, mad. It was, coincidentally, a large Boeing aircraft, you know, airliner-shaped, with four engines. Um, and now... With that in mind, a 747 is also a large Boeing aircraft, which is airliner shaped with four engines. Mm -hmm. In the dark. Yeah, in the dark, right? And there was another circumstance, which is that Soviet Air Defense Command detected the plane late while it was already over the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is because someone forgot to fix the radar which had been blown out in a gale 10 days before. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> they didn't send somebody across a, like, a, toast, a totally like blasted, frozen moor to go and fix the fucking radar. Yeah, exactly. That's and just sloppiness. Well, apparently someone had told Moscow they had fixed it uh, in an attempt oh, to... God not, yeah. fucking damn yeah. it, I hate the <laughs> 1980s. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't want to get chewed out by someone, and they're like, I'll fix it eventually. Probably nothing will happen, right? So they, they, inter- they detected this plane about two hours after they should have, right? Um, and as a result, you know, the plane's almost out of the airspace already. They scramble some fighters. They were MiG-23s, right? They try and make visual contact with the aircraft. But uh, apparently somehow they managed to run low on fuel <laughs> and had I mean- to turn back. <laughs> Listen, at this point in the in Soviet history, they're probably taking off with like fumes in the tank anyway. This is true, yeah. There's a guy so at the like, airbase who's like selling it off to people. It's yeah. So this was their first attempt at intercepting the unknown airline uh, unknown airplane, right? It was now back out over international waters. Um and this was really embarrassing, right? Um because after the flyovers during Fleet X83, a whole bunch of uh, high-ranking uh, Soviet air defense guys have been fired for their failure to intercept any of the planes, right? Um, but they they realize if this plane's on a constant heading, they have another chance when it flies over uh, Sakhalin, right? Or is it Sakhalin? I don't know how Sakhalin, yeah. Sakhalin, okay. Uh, it was a very small window of opportunity, though, right? Because Sakhalin is a very thin island. That's the big island just north of Japan, right? Uh, used to be Japanese, but I think the uh, Soviet Union took it over after World War II because fuck you. Um, <laughs> yeah. This whole time, by the way, more and more senior people are getting out of bed at four in the morning. Yes, um, a lot of these, a lot of these orders come from like really high up, right? Um, it's kind of like backseat driving almost. It's like man, it's micromanagement because you you get like colonels and generals like sort of like yelling down the phone to to captains and lieutenants who are like so shouting all over each other. One imagines, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, like looking at radar orders. screens, yeah. or or at some points like uh, actually yelling at the pilots. Yes, um, you know, in order to like destroy the, the order to destroy this mystery aircraft came from pretty high up. It was uh, General Valery Kaminsky, right? Uh, he's commander of Soviet air defense in the Far East, um, but he did want some visual confirmation to ensure it was not a civilian plane, right? It looked pretty bad if they shot down a civilian plane. Um, but they had almost no time to do this, right? Mm. So they scrambled three Su-15 fighters from Dolinsk Sokol Air Base, right, which is on Sakhalin. Um, and they get another MiG-23 to come in as well. Uh, they made visual contact with the plane, um, and one one of the uh, so so they're there. They're next to the plane, right? They're trying to intercept. One of them fires warning shots at uh, the uh, KL 007, right? Um, now the problem was it was night, and they were regular bullets. They weren't they weren't tracer no rounds. Great. No tracer rounds. No. So cool. yeah, that's <sighs> good. That did. 
Now, the other thing is they, they tried to, you know, dip their wings to indicate, hey, you're being intercepted. And you get, go, go land somewhere, right? Um, and no response. No one on the flight deck knows anything is happening, right? They don't know they're being intercepted. This is not a great interception mm-hmm. in my mind. Um, <laughs> you should generally know you're being intercepted if you want to not get shot down. And if you're not sure if the plane is civilian or not, you should not get there, get up there with the uh, idea that we're going to not, we're, we're absolutely, we want to shoot down this plane before we have other options. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a Soviet air defense guy. Maybe they have a different doctrine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so major Gennady oh Nikolaevich oh Osipovich, right? <laughs> yes. Gennady Nikolaevich Osipovich. Yes. Uh, he, he's uh, in the lead SU-15. That's this this fighter jet here, the cool stainless steel. Yeah, the, the Flagon, it's codenamed. Yeah. What a stupid codename. They, 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 they imposed a lot of stupid NATO codenames, reporting names, on, um, on Soviet aircraft, and uh, a lot of Soviet pilots really hated them. Uh, the one they hated the most was the fish bed. <laughs> That's just dumb. Mm-hmm. Because it had to start with an F to show that it was yeah, a fighter, and it had to be right. two syllables to show that it was jet powered. Uh, but yeah, it was a MiG twenty one. They called it a fish bed. Um. So Azipovich, he was in the lead uh, uh, plane, right? Uh, and according to a nineteen ninety one interview with uh, Izvestia, right? He he was like, okay, this is a Boeing airplane, right? Um. And you know, but he's looking for a Boeing airplane. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. With four engines. It yep. had four engines. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. He's like, okay, yeah, this is. Uh, it kind of looked like it might be a civilian aircraft because it had some windows on the side. But he thought, you know, maybe this is a modified civilian plane being used to trick for, us. Damn it! Yeah, mm-hmm. used for military yep. purposes. We, right? We fired some warning shots. It didn't even like blink. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, here's an interesting one. Um, now, keep in mind, they never actually tried to like contact the plane via radio. Um, which would have been perfectly doable because you know everyone knows the emergency frequency, right? Um, mm. <laughs> you know all these all these generals are like arguing with each other. The, the plane's about to leave uh, Soviet airplace airspace again. Uh, finally, someone says, "Listen, just shoot it down, right? Just fucking do it. And, we'll deal with it in the morning." <laughs> and so, Azivovich tries to get a lock on, right? The thing is, simultaneously, the crew of KL 007 asked Tokyo Air Traffic Control for permission to ascend to 35,000 feet for fuel economy, right? And this, this permission was granted. So <laughs> Just accidentally <laughs> taking evasive maneuvers. <laughs> yes. Oops. Quite literally. And this is where uh, Azipovich was sure, all right, they're taking evasive maneuvers. This is, this is a military target, right? Uh, so the plane pitched up and slowed down, and Azipovich's... Uh, SU-15 just blew right past it, right? Again, that would genuinely be quite clever if they yeah. had done it on purpose. If they had done it on purpose, yeah. We love to have an international incident where the explanation is whoopsie daisy. Whoop. So, <laughs> Zivovich does some, like, Top Gun shit to, like, get his plane in position to actually get a lock Start on. Start slamming a beach volleyball around. Yeah. Things are very confusing. <laughs> he's, exactly. he's probably having a fantastic time. He's like, oh, shit. It's I, like get the, the, I get to I do get it. To I do get it. to do it. I get to do it. I get to do the thing. But according to his interview in 1991, he's still sure it was a military target. <laughs> Good for him, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he managed to get a lock on. He fires two K-8 missiles at it, right? Air-to-air missiles. And they both hit the tail of the plane, right? Um, and this is where, all right. So, so this plane is uh, not, not doing great, so hot. Yeah, not, <laughs> no, this so is already hot. a problem. Yeah, yeah. Starts ascending involuntarily. They lose cabin pressure, right? You and know the, how um, it, uh, whenever you're like afraid of flying, they tell you, "Don't, don't worry." Like airliners, they're built redundant. They're built to keep flying in a lot of different situations. One of those situations where that is not the case is when they are hit with a missile designed to destroy an aircraft. Replace all civilian airliners with A10s. <laughs> they still have Need that strong wing route. Yeah. At this point, they still have limited control of the plane. Fairly impressive, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. There were four hydraulic systems. Three of them were severed, were non-functional. They still had, I think, ailerons 
And uh, that was about it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the pilots are like, okay, we got we lost cabin pressure. We got to get this thing down to 10,000 feet immediately, um, which they start doing. They have enough control to do that. Uh, they start uh, blaring the automatic emergency um, announcement in the, in the cabin, which goes, put out your cigarette. This is an emergency descent. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm not going to put yeah. out my cigarette. No, I'm I might, just, I'm just, I'm I'm just eat it. I'm going to just eat it. I'm going to just eat it. If I'm going down, I'm taking all the tobacco in me. So they, they have this plane relatively under control for like five or six more minutes. But by the time they get down to um, 16,000 feet, they lose it, right? Um, and it starts spiraling around and losing altitude. And after 12 minutes after the missile hit them, it hit the ocean, right? Right near Monoran Island, right? Which is just a couple miles from international waters. But they did, to their credit, they kept it within Soviet airspace. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So the plane crashed. Everyone died. Um, Damn. Yeah. What did we learn? Yeah. End of episode. End of episode. No, it gets, it gets stupider. Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks. You get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. No, some some more Russians have to yell at each it's other. The Soviets this. in the eighties. Things are going to yeah. get dumb as hell. Uh huh. Uh huh. Some generals have to yell at some other generals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some guy named Vasily is just going to have to go diving. Yep. Yeah. So that, well, they, they, uh, there, there were some people yelling at uh, Asipovich. Uh, about why didn't you destroy the target? Because it was still flying for so long afterwards. What, what are you, right? gay or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and about a half hour after the incident, they're like, oh shit, that was a uh, airliner. Fuck. <laughs> whoops. Yeah, whoops. Asipovich sort of riding this high of like, I'm gonna get promoted. Coming in for a smooth landing, just like expecting a medal. <laughs> yeah, he, he like does the Top Gun carrier scene at the end on his yeah. way out of the plane, and he just gets into the Court mess. Marshaled. Yeah, he gets into the mess, everyone's staring at him. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, he followed the orders that were being rapidly... Um, sort of the Wehrmacht! Very... very <laughs> Very rapidly. Well, he he thought it was a military target, <laughs> and and he kind he, of thought to this day he these, thinks it was, which is these, super convenient for him. All these I, I kind all of these respect that over tired generals are are just how screaming they hung at over? him. They just woke up. It's from <laughs> Russia. How they hung over? Yeah. How they tired? They, oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. It's three a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, old people get up early. It's three a.m. They've just gone to bed it was after 4 a long like night of drinking, ago, wasn't it? <laughs> no, okay, it was about 4 a.m., but, well, there's also time zones is the other thing. Oh, I hate God, that. All right, just following orders is a bad argument, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway. Let, let, let's, you, let's say- You let's and say, Albert can share a cell at Spandau. <laughs> let's say provocation the and, provoca like, mistaken yeah. identity, then. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like at, so, at some point, the U.S. Air Force has to own some share of responsibility for this. Yes. About a half hour later, they start organizing search and rescue teams, right? And they dispatch helicopters to roughly the location of the shootdown. The Soviets do, right? Uh, they make some civilian fishing boats go to the scene. 
Right, and they realize. <laughs> yeah, oh. like, because they have to, because this is so in the middle of nowhere that right. there's no like border guards who can yeah. get there on time. So it's literally it's helicopters and it's fishermen. Yeah, and they get there and they're like, "Oh shit, there's nothing Whoops. here." Whoops! <laughs> yeah, that was not a that was not a safe landing. Um, you know, and 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 it's not too long afterward that word gets out this plane has been shot down. There was some there was some report for a while out there that um. The plane had been forced to land at Sakhalin, and you know, in fact, it was forced to land in the water near Sakhalin and not safely. Um, <laughs> forced to land in the water uh, landing, yeah. five to eight hundred miles an hour. Yeah, yeah I love, exactly. I love this, uh, the event of a water landing, you could just say plane crash. So the um, yeah, no Captain Sully here, unfortunately, right? No. Um. You know, and and because it was the Cold War, you know, after search and rescue teams from the USA and Japan also arrived, no one could coordinate with each other, and in fact, they were actively harassing each other, <laughs> um, <Just> throwing rocks <laughs> at each other. Hey, yes, you guys look like nerds. Just yeah, tossing stones at the other one. <laughs> Japanese <laughs> whaling boat is just ramming the Soviets. It's yeah. got the like cannons they use on Greenpeace boats going. <laughs> the um the the Soviets did attempt to board a Japanese search and rescue vessel, I believe, but the uh, uh, the United States uh, just shoved the destroyer in between the two boats and prevented them from doing that. I'll do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that kind concert. of like muscular sort of naval diplomacy there. Yeah, oh, they were all they were all like uh, the Soviets were like trying to get lock ons on the uh, American ships. They were they were doing everything short of shooting at each other. They may have even done a little bit of that. Um, but <laughs> What's a nice friendly shooting between superpowers? Exactly. So, so the issue was this plane crashed in. You can see here on a diagram. This is Soviet territorial waters here, right? And so, the uh, uh, the 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 Americans could only search outside of that circle, right? Um, so you know, and this is another circle which is. Japanese waters, um, excuse me, uh, Soviet waters. Uh, so they're, they're searching in sort of the area just outside that. Right. Um, and they're just trying to get as close as they can to territorial waters without giving the Soviets an excuse to do anything. Although they're just doing it anyway. They're, they're all, they're all having a great time. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just hitting each other, you know, just, just doing, doing, doing cold <laughs> war shit. Hitting each other's sticks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But the Soviets absolutely refused to allow anyone into their territorial waters to look for the wreck, you know, which is the most likely location of it. I think everyone knew at this point. Uh, this is this is this all occurs over like the next week and a half, two weeks, right? Yeah, the Soviets um, are in full like ass covering mode at this point. Exactly. They're they're they have this sort of vested interest in finding the plane first, so that they can grab the black box and find some excuse that it was a spy plane. Right, mm. <laughs> Hur hurriedly paint a bunch of like USAF decals on it. The flight number said 007. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. Um. So the Soviets found the plane, right? Um. And according to some civilian divers who got down to the wreck later, they made a huge mess of it. Right. Uh, well, they were in a hurry. Yeah. Like on on purpose or accidentally is my question. Yes. I, yes. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, <laughs> guy in a full scuba yeah. gear going down there with a sledgehammer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, a big, big part of it was um, they used they fishing. Facility, don't make too big mess. You know what facility do? Make too big mess. <laughs> <laughs> they used fishing trawlers. They used fishing trawlers to search for it, right? So I guess they're just bringing up huge nets full of airplane parts. I don't. I don't I, <laughs> You um, should become a fisher of men. Y yes. <laughs> and the official story is very few bodies or body parts are recovered from the wreck and very little luggage, right? Um, but the Soviets did manage to pluck the black box out of the wreckage. That's convenient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's also some speculation that the Soviets had two search parties, one of which was a decoy to fool the Americans and Japanese into searching somewhere else for the wreckage. Was oh, that's smart. Was so stupid. That's yeah. Smart. <laughs> this was all kept quiet until the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Um, and the Soviet media initially was like, "Okay, we're we, Andropov said to keep quiet about this, so they did." 
they just said the military shot down a plane which violated Soviet airspace, um, but not that they had shot down an airliner, right? Yeah. Um, which no one, no one, uh, no one believed, including the Soviet Union's own foreign ministry. They were like, <laughs> "No, we fucked up. You have to, you have to admit to this, <laughs> right?" But Andropov is like. Make me very, very ill, like barely competent to do anything. So, you know, I, I don't know if he, I don't know if he was up to making big decisions like that. Even if he was, he was like a lifelong KGB guy. He had that like instinctual secrecy. Right. This is also true. An interesting one is on the U.S. side, the National Transportation Safety Board was legally required to investigate the shoot down because the plane had U.S. citizens on it and had departed from U.S. soil, right? Ronald Reagan State Department says, nah, don't, don't do that, right? And, uh, you know, they, they, they blocked them on the grounds that the shoot down was not an accident, right? And they handed the investigation over to the International Civil Aviation Organization, right? Which didn't really investigate accidents. And unlike the NTSB, did not have the power of subpoena, right? Well, so they, that Reagan, one smart guy. Yeah, I know. They couldn't compel anyone <laughs> to provide any documents. Um, so in order for this investigation to proceed, they required the full, full co cooperation of all governments involved uh, and the United States government itself, right? Oh, I bet they got it. Uh, yes, that, that means they got it. Yeah, there were there was some there was some uh, information that was um, never provided that should have been. <laughs> mm. Crazy. Yeah, notably radar data from uh, King Sam in Alaska, which was the last location to track the plane on the U.S. side. Um, that was uh, apparently quote unquote destroyed very oh. shortly after the uh, accident occurred. And right. I was never here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, why, why destroy it? Just because you don't want the Soviets to know to what extent your radar is like covering Alaska, or oh, uh, they 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 said they usually just reuse the tapes. Uh, yeah, it's like well, a lost well. episode of Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> lost episode of Well, there's your problem for that yeah. matter. We will never release the lost episode. <laughs> yeah, no. ICAO. Of course, uh, they came to the conclusion this deviation was caused by. A lack of awareness on the flight uh, on the part of the flight crew. You know, it's human error, right? Um, now, this is this is also done without the benefit of the flight data recorder, the black box. You know, because the Soviets have it, right? And they're not sharing. Um, but in, in meantime, the uh, United States uh, is uh, reacting swiftly and punitively. Like Reagan's out there, he says this is a massacre, an act of barbarism, right? Some of the intercepted radio communications about the plane were submitted at a UN special hearing, right? So everyone's kind of like, oh yeah, the Soviet shot this thing down. Um, mm. And uh, Soviet media was even forced to admit, ah, yeah, that was, that was us. Oops. <laughs> um, they banned Aeroflot from flying into U.S. airports. And, you know, the Soviets blamed the Americans for deliberately probing Soviet air defense systems and also sort of implied that, you know, this was a, a plane on a secret CIA mission Yes, but of some not this kind. time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's a half-truth. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, the, they're right about the, the probing, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's a, this unfortunate case of playing stupid games and then someone else wins stupid prizes. I was about to say, I, I definitely say, if, you're, if, you're, if your big uh, reconnaissance platform looks uh, very similar to an airliner, um, you may you may wind up with an incident like this occurring, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, with already strained, you know, U.S.-Soviet relations, this was, this was not a great situation to be in, unless you were Reagan, because you wanted that sort of thing, right? Because um, you were a proper lunatic, yeah. Exactly, right. But a lot of the long-term fallout from this was mitigated because Gorbachev's revisionism collapsed the USSR. God right? damn it. Yes. Fucking Pizza Hut. <laughs> yep. Um, and, you know, Pizza Hut, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, history remembers this one as a clearly irresponsible act of aggression by the Soviet Union, right? Uh, whereas sure. five years later, when the U.S. accidentally shot down Iran Air 655, that was an honest misunderstanding, right? 
Um, <laughs> my my favorite detail about that is that they gave all of the sailors on uh, on the USS Vincennes uh, the combat action ribbons for that. Or oh combat my action God. badges. That's a dick move. That's, that's, a dick ge move, that's yeah. genuinely true. You, you, yeah, you I got believe little... you. I'm not saying you're lying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By 1993, you know, the USSR dissolved. It's when Boris Yeltsin finally released the black box, black box recordings, right? Um, now this was sort of done in a weird series of uh, uh, things. Like he gave first, they gave the containers for the recordings, but not the recordings themselves. It's I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if that mm -hmm. was intentional or Yeltsin was just. Yes, drunk. it was intentional. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? Yeltsin was drunk. I'll give him the benefit yeah, of the doubt. Yeah, and, and then they they finally released the actual recordings, right? But they were missing the last ten minutes before the plane crashed, and. No ah. one's quite certain why the tapes stopped, right? Could be any number of reasons. Yeah. And and one one piece of fallout from this was um, you know, they maybe a positive thing is this was the incident that sort of provoked, as Liam said earlier, GPS being open to the public, right? Yeah, I see that For, on the very last slide now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still, also, still, of course, noticeably does not stop people from shooting down airliners because they think they're uh, military aircraft. <laughs> Just mostly now with surface to air missiles rather than air to air. I was about to say, this was, uh, we're well past the heyday of accidental airline shoot downs because that was like 1970 through 1990. But it does still happen occasionally. Um, mm -hmm. But it does seem to be more intentional now. <laughs> um, you know, it's usually like some insurgents doing it or something. Uh, yeah. Although in in the like leaked phone calls, very similar to this, uh, with the the sort of Russian backed, uh, well, in fact, Russian surface to air missile crew, who who shot down that Malaysian plane MH17 over oh, Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, they, they were just like, oh yeah, we shot down an American spy plane. Uh, it's like, guys, same. Fucking mistake in the same. Did, did, did you got uh, Oops, I did it again. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's like a sort yeah. of a generational thing, you know. Yeah, everyone's got to shoot down an airliner once, you know. It just happens. It makes you a man. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. It's a, it's a rite of passage. Um, <laughs> Soviet Union did it. The Russian Federation has to do it too. Mm -hmm. um, Whatever follows the Russian Federation is going to do it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So another thing is they uh, there were sort of improvements to airplane autopilot systems to make them more intuitive to use, make them more user friendly, make it more obvious when they're on the wrong setting. Um, <laughs> yeah, they added a big yeah. clippy. Yeah, exactly. Looks like you're trying to not get shot down by the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, Would you like to accidentally take evasive maneuvers? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to accidentally do some Top Gun shit? But it, it took a couple months for Aeroflot to be allowed back into the United States. They did do it relatively quickly. It wasn't like a permanent ban. Um, you know, but U.S. Soviet relations were just not good. Um, I, I believe the Soviet Union was able to take on a bigger role in like air traffic control of airplanes after this. Well, that's um, good. Yeah. For the like six months that it continued to exist, exactly right. Um, and then some guy yeah. came and sold all of the radars for scrap, yeah, by crocodile. <laughs> and then, um, you know, but one of the things about this is a lot of the information about it didn't come out for a long time. We didn't get the black box for a long time, so we didn't know what was going on on the uh, airplane itself. And you know, of course, we lost the last ten minutes, which is where we come to. Conspiracies. Hell yeah. 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 We're in the Eustica <laughs> zone. Every one of these is true at the same time. Yes. So, you know, unusual circumstances behind the shoot down, unusual circumstances behind the recovery, lots of missing data. There's lots of conspiracy theories, right? Yeah, um, sure. It's like high drama. It's like uh, Cold War thriller stuff. Yes. So, one theory is that the plane intentionally deviated from its course and was, you know, maybe a CIA spy mission, right? Or maybe they were trying to probe Soviet air defenses again. What if we flew a civilian airliner in there, huh? What'll happen? Well, this'll happen, apparently. Uh, you'll kill them all. Um, <laughs> Funny, and yeah. like, believable for the CIA to care that little, but stupid. Yeah. Well, it seems unlikely, given the number of fail-safes on a 747 and navigational aids, and radars and so on and so forth, the pilots would be so catastrophically unaware of their actual location, right? 
So, you know, it, 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 it plausible, it seems plausible that, you know, they, they know where they're going. And there's some kind of maybe outlandish misdirection. Maybe, maybe the plane didn't actually get shot down. Maybe there was uh, one theory involves like, you know, the plane sort of got away. It was a distraction. And then the U.S. and the USSR got into a, a fighter dog fight, right? Yeah. And this is based on the testimony. Sure. This was based on the testimony of one Japanese fisherman who was in the area at the time. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Listen, the testimony of one Japanese fisherman is enough for me. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that once the, once the recordings came out, um, it was fairly clear that everyone on the uh, flight deck was pretty relaxed the whole way they were flying over restricted airspace. You know, they're, they're not like, they don't like tense up as they're like, oh my God, we're going into the USSR. We might get shot down at any second. Right. Um, you know, there's not, there's not like situational awareness that they're doing something illegal or risky. So if it was a spy mission, the pilots were certainly somehow unaware that it was. <laughs> or ice cold CIA operatives. Oh uh, yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> back when back when CIA officers were hard instead of now where they just think they get Havana syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> now there are some uh questions around why didn't they find any bodies, right? Uh there were some like body parts that washed up in Japan. Um, there were a few body parts that were found by uh, Russian divers, but like in general, the official account says very few bodies are recovered, almost no luggage, um, you know, nothing from uh, nothing from the cargo hold, right? Uh, which is interesting. And um, there's some theories as to why this was, right? Uh, one theory is that crabs ate all the bodies immediately. I mean, now very frightened of crabs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't like crabs. Well, that was an unexpected yeah. outcome of this episode, was that I be suddenly became much more frightened of crabs than I thought I had any reason to be. Uh, these are like those big Japanese spider crabs, you know, with the Ooh, seven fuck. foot long legs. <laughs> nope. No, yeah. no, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, they found a wreck uh, within like, I think I, it, it was like within 10 days um, they found it, so it's unlikely the crabs worked that fast. Um, so that's 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 maybe not a plausible explanation. Another uh, another another idea is that um, everyone got sucked out of the plane due to explosive decompression, right? <laughs> um, you know, so they got sucked out while they were, uh, the plane was still in the air. I mean, this is this is another interesting thing because a lot of the clothing that was recovered uh, was like. You know, it was like it was like the clothing was there, you know, zipped up, being worn, uh, but there was nothing inside it, right? <laughs> so they thought maybe people have been sucked out of their clothes. Now, an explosive decompression like that is kind of unlikely because you know the plane still was able had limited control. You know, was can the you plane. get sucked out of your clothes? Yeah, that's that's where I I'm uh, a little I don't understand don't that one. Believe. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I guess you can, but like, that would be a pretty, that would be a pretty neat trick. I was about to say, yeah, mm. especially since I, I don't, I don't think the, uh, the decompression from uh, one from from like me, me atmospheric a girl who will suck me out of my clothes. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> god damn it! Another theory is the missile damaged the plane in such a way that both the nose and the tail fell off. Right? <laughs> Just riding sort of this, <laughs> this like hollow tube perfectly yeah. down to the ground. <laughs> yes. Um, so that creates a wind tunnel, and that sucks people out of the plane. Listen, right? I, I've I've played the like uh, plane mission in in uh, teardown. Never seen that shit happen. So <laughs> scientifically, using my scientific expertise, I don't think so. And and that that would explain at least why the black box stopped recording because I think it's powered from. Uh, Fairly back, far back in the plane. I'm not sure. I may be wrong. Um, mm. You know, so the, 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 that is one theory. And another theory is, of course, Soviet body snatchers. Um, that, they just, that's absolutely the true one. There, yeah. was a, there was a guy down there with a fucking like shovel hacking them up. And then, yeah. like, yeah, that seems yeah. about right. He had about 10 days to do it. They, they probably could have shoved all the people in a net and just hauled them up. Yeah, yeah. Put, put, put them in a bunch of garbage bags, bury them on some well, bullshit coffins. islands. Zane yeah, coffins. Yeah, 
another conspiracy theory, which also explains this, is of course the plane landed safely in Sakhalin, right? And they all and, uh, turned uh, to be. They they all wanted to be Soviet. And nothing oh, yeah. that ever happened. Yeah, exactly. Or they all got sent to the Gulag, right? Yeah. <laughs> fight for a chance for survival. Now, mm-hmm. the, the John Birch Society likes this theory, um, as well as I, I believe there's a, a media organization, a conservative one called Accuracy in Media. Should have been um, Accuracy in Airplane Navigation. More like Accuracy in Media. Exactly. So, like, this is, this is one of those conspiracies which requires the USSR to be be basically a, a a comic book villain, right? They do evil for the sake of doing evil, right? So, oh, oh that we, we we forced the plane to land, and then we sent everyone to the gulag for the hell of it. You know why not, right? Um, it's really more of a Stalin move than a than an Andropov one. Yeah, I don't, I don't even, I, I don't even think Stalin would do that. I yes, mean, he would. Know, Come on now. <laughs> yeah, you can't. The guy, the guy who let his own son die in prison wouldn't do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you, you keep them for some negotiating purposes at least. Yeah, they can stay you know, alive in yeah. Gulag for a while. You, yeah, but you tell them you have them. Right, it doesn't make sense to just send them to Gulag oh, and yeah, not okay. tell anyone. Yeah, you like, oh, you, like sh- you like shoot them up full of LSD and like try and like find out all their secrets. Fine, whatever. No, but, like, no, that's yeah. an American thing, Alice. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> show some respect, please. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't mean to disrespect you. Like, program. yeah, <laughs> I don't mean to disrespect your folk ways. I'm sorry. It's the so- the Soviet Union would just use vodka, you know? Uh, yeah. We had to Guy just gets a, you drunk. They just give you two bottles of vodka and a vial of crocodile and say, "Have at it." <laughs> I was about to <laughs> One say, of those the, little pickles. Yeah. The United States has to design a designer drug to uh, get people to spill secrets, and the Soviets just use vodka. And that's one of those <laughs> one of those cultural differences. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the uh, another version says the Soviets did something called meekening, right? Which is basically you intercept navigational radio signals and then you rebroadcast them to make the pilots think that they were somewhere that they weren't. Yeah, it's right? the thing we used to do as bombing aids in the Second World War to draw yeah. uh, Luftwaffe bombs off course. And this could be for the purpose of getting Representative Larry McDonald. You know, they want they want to they want to get him right Sorry, because of but, like. Uh, okay, he's he's anti-communist. He's in yeah. he's like the the head of the John. So Burke is society. everybody. Like he, yeah, like uh, sorry, but a U.S. representative is not that important. Not a, sen- a senator, a, a yeah, senator maybe, say. but like, come on, man. Well, there's supposed to be uh, uh, two representatives and a senator on this flight, but well, again, they were like they were in the flight behind him. But mm. I also don't I don't think the USSR is. Um, in the mood to do something that provocative. So, right? yeah. so this is a KGB guy in Alaska who's like trying to call in that you got to call off the strike, but he just doesn't have like a nickel, so you can't use the payphone. Yeah, exactly. He's like, oh no, you have to get both the planes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Just do it. The other thing is, I don't think the meekening would have worked if um, the plane was on INS. It's the other thing, you know. So uh, uh, you know, because it's everything's referenced internally, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know enough about autopilot to say that definitively though. I might be completely wrong. Um, but it, it, it's kind of like, I don't know why you would try and, you know, assassinate a representative in such a dramatic fashion. The high risk, low reward yeah. comes to yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. High risk, yeah. low reward. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, if they, if they did intercept and force it down and, you know, you put these people in a gulag, all right, then what? What are you negotiating for? Right, you're just doing pointless escalation, and that's that's what Ronald Reagan is supposed to be doing, <laughs> right? You know, yeah, yeah, and and you know, the most likely conspiracy theory I could think is that you know, there's aspects of this incident that were covered up by the United States, you know, for oh, political the ends. US right? is, the U.S. is absolutely yeah. oh, covering sure. up something here. Yeah. Fuck if I know what, but like. <laughs> I, probably the one thing I've learned from doing this podcast is that whatever it is, it probably has absolutely nothing to do with like Larry McDonald or anyone else, and it's just like a pure coincidence that yeah. like some other CIA shit was happening at the same time. Yeah, it's like I I, I tend to prefer the mundane uh, situation, which is that they just you know this was this was a 
this was a minor fuck up that was escalated into just a huge fuck up through like coincidences of where our aircraft were at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I this is, uh, I don't think anyone really got, well, I mean, obviously the Soviet Union was blamed for it, right? I, I don't know mm-hmm. who suffered consequences except by means of revisionism. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, That's you might a, you might lose yeah. out on your Soviet air defense uh, air defense forces pension, which you will definitely be able to collect in 1991. Right, uh, you just um, you know, you just uh, uh, sell your shares in a state corporation to uh, some guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, for an IOU, that's a great. Yeah, and then oh. then a couple of months later, you're found floating face down in the NSA. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. What's happened, Alice? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, this is uh, this is this is um, you know there, there there's aspects of this that are mysterious, but um, you know it seems seems to me like well, bad luck. <laughs> this sort of yeah. like comedy of errors, yeah. 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 Um, well, it's well, a good thing that the Cold War is over, and we're not going to start a new one anytime soon. Yeah, exactly. It certainly, uh, certainly won't um, provoke uh, the Chinese and the. Having an accident like this, um. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are the um? What are the flight routes around Taiwan looking like these days? <laughs> oh I'm just God. asking. <laughs> well, that one I think is a little bit more difficult to justify. I don't know, doing a big U over mainland China <laughs> to get into Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even just think perfectly I... drawing a dick and balls in your flight plan <laughs> over mainland China. <laughs> yeah, pointing right at Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> well, did I already ask? What did we learn? We learned uh, never to allow Don't fly revisionism mm-hmm. into the presidium of the Supreme Soviet. It's true. Otherwise, uh, soon your pension will be worthless, and you will be unable to afford even the Pizza Hut that has opened in Red Square. They needed to find a young anti-revisionist to run that country. Yeah, you're adding yeah. more so, fossils who have grown soft. <laughs> all, all, all of us are available. Uh, no, if any, if anyone's asking, no, two thirds of us are available. Yeah. If anybody's asking, and One if of anyone us will wants check to check himself into gulag, if you, thank you. Yeah. If, you <laughs> if you have a Soviet Union that needs running, ask mm-hmm. Alice or I. We will step yeah, that's up right. to the task. That's right. <laughs> we we will do that for you, the people. Uh, yes, our, our truest love. Uh, I cannot be bothered, of course. <laughs> no, of course. You're too busy doing like brake light clinics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm the vanguard of the revolution. God damn it. <laughs> Whoa. <Yeah. laughs> revolution. Not very exciting, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> outside outside the Yorsa conference changing the brake lights. <sighs> If you or a loved one has been affected by revisionism, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have well. a segment on this podcast called Safety Thirds. Shake hands with danger. This is a, uh, what do you see on the screen in front of you is a plastic keg, something which I was not aware existed until this email came in. No, it really? looks very flimsy. That's what yeah. wine keg, that's, uh, that's wine kegs, man. Oh. I mean, they I have know, a wine came in kegs. Oh hell yeah, there's kegged wine. Hmm. I've never, I've never been. Is that like a caterer thing? Like you need to do no. a bunch of wine? No, no. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Apparently, this one is for beer. It is a one-way keg, right? Oh. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. We used to deal with wine kegs at the liquor store occasionally. The draft wine had a moment a couple of years ago, and then it, you know, mm. kind of shit and piss in its own mouth. Yeah. Uh, Which normally kinda... I would find erotic, but. Of course. Yeah. I, I, a draft wine, God. Yeah. Hello, Shut up, w- you like t- cider. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, WTYP crew and possibly guest. Nope, no I guest. Hope. We killed them all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I hope you all are doing well. Shut yeah. the fuck up. I have a safety third from the restaurant industry that involves knives, oh, no. guns, and explosions. Let's go. A while ago, I worked in a restaurant that served draft beer. Before the beer gets poured, it lives in kegs in a big refrigerated room behind the taps. I don't like saying it lives. I mean, it's got <laughs> yeast in it. I guess it does. It but like, yeah. Normally, these kegs were metal and got sent away for a deposit when emptied. But one day, we ended up with two plastic kegs 
demonstration image attached that for whatever reason couldn't be returned and instead needed to be thrown out. Now, this is an aside from me. I looked these things up after seeing this, and there was a whole bunch of websites like, we make plastic kegs. They're sustainable one-way keg solutions, right? And then, uh, and, and, and then I read some, folks, some stuff from folks in the restaurant industry, and like, oh, yeah, these all get thrown in the garbage. Nothing gets recycled. Yeah. <laughs> now the kegs sometimes had a buildup of pressure in them even after all the beer was gone and because the people who ran the dump are fascists who fa- frown on things like impromptu bombs that's not what it says no, <laughs> that's not what it says no that's we're doing we're, we're doing not, a little I'm, bit of censorship I'm, here that's not, not what it as, says as is, as is our want to, as is our want living in the top left corner of this scum. political compass revisionist scum <laughs> No, I'm being anti-revisionist. You are being revisionist. You're literally revising what the nice listener wrote in. That's not what revisionism is. No. It doesn't matter. The revision, <laughs> the, the 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 fucking okay. So the traitor who sent in the safety third <laughs> used the word communists. Yes, and I decided, I decided that for the purposes of political education. You know how annoying it is to have to word. claim you two as comrades. For, for, for the purposes of left <laughs> unity. Yes. Yeah, you know how annoying left unity is? I'm just like, yep, out here with my two communist pals, <laughs> god damn it. <laughs> Who frown on things like impromptu bombs being mixed in with the rest of the trash they receive. Part of the procedure for getting rid of these plastic kegs was to let the pressure out. My understanding is this was normally done by slowly bleeding pressure out of a valve on the keg. Unfortunately, this process was not fast enough for our chef. Well, Uh-oh. there is one word for describing a very fast release of pressure. Um, yes. Catastrophic? I was going to say explosion, but yeah. Yes. After being warned that what he was doing was monumentally stupid, he dragged one of the kegs into the parking lot next to the restaurant and stabbed it with a kitchen knife. Oh my god, dude. I hope he wasn't <laughs> leaning over it. <laughs> Remember what I said about these kegs being potential bombs when they still have pressure in them. This particular keg had quite a lot of pressure in it, and as soon as the knife punctured the plastic, there was a tremendous bang as the keg peeled itself apart like an orange in about a fraction of a second. Seeing as how he was holding the knife, the chef's arm took a beating as the explosion transferred much of its force into his hand, fracturing several bones. I don't need both arms to be a chef. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like it's not like being a surgeon. Right? <laughs> Weight savings. Yeah. <laughs> we even I saw can... a lightning kit on the chef. Luckily, he didn't suffer any other injuries, though his hand was in a brace for several weeks afterwards. I would like the story to end here, but it doesn't. As I said, there were two of these kegs that needed to be disposed of. And it turned out the main lesson learned from Keg 1 was not that pressure vessel plus violence equals bad things. It was that pressure vessel plus close range violence equals bad things. Oh no. This was easy enough to solve as the management were good Americans and the next day the second keg was taken out in the woods and shot. Good. (laughs) Shake hands, danger. That wasn't the drop I meant to play. What I meant to play was... Second keg taken out into the woods and shot for yep. a revisionist crime. Revisionism, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Second keg got was a, uh, liquidated. Ooh. Yeah, got, got NKVD. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yes. g- g- going out into the woods with a with a macaroff and a keg full of draft beer. <laughs> <laughs> Worry about you, don't worry about me. Yeah. <laughs> Keep up the good work, guys. Very stoked to hear about the Boston Molasses Flood next episode. Now I can play this drop. Shake hands with danger. That is our next episode, the Boston Molasses Disaster. The Boston oh, Molasses Malassica. Disaster. The Molassica, if you will. Well, Does anyone, anyone have any commercials before we go? 
Kill James Bond, 10,000 uh, Kill James Bond, Lawson, 10, Lions, Led Losses, Lions Led by Donkeys, uh, Franklin. Fra- yeah. Franklin, Franklin in VR, the Franklin yeah. Metaverse experience. Yes. Oh my god. You don't want to do that? You don't want to oh. do Franklin in VR? Uh, the frame rate would be really bad. Frame rate's already nausea. really bad. You have 3,800 mods. Yeah, but frame rate in VR is very, very important, so you don't throw up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can live like, with it. I, I can behold watch a very valid the beauty part. of like 19th century Franklin and his vomit copiously into a yes. trash can I have on my lap for the purpose. Uh, that's hungover rise. <laughs> yeah. Try, trying to <laughs> Wondrous things. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? We're good. Yeah, I it's think that's the end of the podcast. All right.